So that is us live now, should be. So uh, hello and welcome back to all of our members. Tonight we're joined by David Leach. And we've just been hearing a bit about what he's been up to recently. Um, so I'll just invite him to start his presentation just now and I'll shut up and put myself on mute. Um, so over to you, David. Thanks a lot, Ronan. I'll start to share my screen. So you can, guys can see that? Yeah, that's perfect, thanks. Great. Uh, so I, I've given this lecture or talk uh, uh, a loose title called First Thoughts. Uh, the practice is, is a relatively new practice. I started, uh, I graduated in 2003, but then I worked for other practices for more than 13 years. And I started doing my own projects in 2016 and uh, the first, two projects were built in 2018 and they're actually the only two projects I've still yet to build and then but after 2018 then I set up my office uh David Leach Architects Limited then in, in 2018 so we're obviously a, a young office even though I'm not that young but uh the, the practice is itself and uh I guess what I'm framing this lecture in is that these are the first thoughts of my practice, the first steps into the ideas and teams and the interests that we want to uh, take forward and progress within my own work. Uh, but although they're first thoughts, I, I think it's important to note and to recognize how, uh, well, nothing really is a, is a first thought or the idea of an invention. It is not an idea that interests me, but actually, thoughts that we're having now are often the same thoughts that architects were having hundreds of years ago which in the renaissance etc but through contemporary filters the importance is how one then translates these ideas into a, a 21st century ideal based on context and context can be with regard to fabric social environmental structural many different parameters and, and possibilities but this is a, a model I made for the Drawing Matter Alternative Histories exhibition, the models on the left hand side here. And it's based on a drawing by Bartholomew B. Enfantine uh, called City Militaire, which is this uh, loose town plan that kind of has a, a very ambiguous border, which looks like the project could continue on indefinitely, how it's, how it's represented. But I was interested in how this could be translated in the 21st century based on ideas of the structure modernism how something that could be have this continuous and uh, efficient way of being planned how that can maybe become a vertical element so because of our situation in time we are looking at architecture as a continuity but because of these uh 21st century filters which are just things we experience around us we are always uh translating and i think that translation is important because one of the things i think is important in my architecture is that I believe architecture has a function, but equally, I think that architecture is equally as important to say is I think architecture has a meaning and how it, how architecture communicates is something that's really important, important to me as a practice. And that idea of communication does not necessarily have to be a modern idea of, a, a, of an extrusion of a plan that explicitly or literally talks about the arrangement or have to be something that where the inside and outside have to be explicitly linked but they can be different. They can, uh, the representation of quality of building to the outside can be different to the, the quality of the interior on the inside. Uh, this is the Villa Sarriego built in, uh, let me have a look, 1517 Donato by Palladio. And what I find really reassuring is that architects, as I say, for hundreds of years have been really discussing the same ideas that in my practice, I find important and I'm trying to grapple with and it's quite good to be able to go back to these architects and see how they were looking at these ideas. Uh, what I like about this project is it's the Villa Sarriego, it's for a, a urban family in the Vanato who moved to the countryside and you can see by the statues in the front there's this duality to this project. There's this the statue of Diana and the statue of Apollo, Diana seen as a uh, uh, of the kind of urban identity and Apollo of the hunting of the rural identity. And this is something that this building tries to synthesize the idea between the fine and the crude. And I, I really like this idea of synthesis, this idea of um, ambiguity, because it means that a building can be read in multiple understandings for different people. So a building can be read uh, 
by how your background relates to it. A building can be read by how you are experiencing it, or a building can be read by how you pass by it. And these all have equal validities to it. In this uh, Palladio Villa, for instance, in terms of its form and its strategy and its massing, uh, in its use of proportion and volume, there's a evocation of, of the Grand Palazzo. But then if you look at the detail and material, there's this a rustication or this kind of simplification of, of, a, of a more simple uh, tectonic of something that's applied almost like a primitive stone hut. Uh, what I like it is obviously the, the Palazzo is talking to meaning different things to different people. It, it, it talks about the, the scale and grandeur of, 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 of the ungenerosity of a, of a palazzo, but at the same time, it, it also relates to the more rural identity, which is now surrounding itself and, and to the folks who are living around it and, and how they could see this building, not necessarily as being something that's alien, but something that's more newly familiar to them, uh, would, would have the evocation of the, the more rustic, simple cottage buildings around, but obviously in the form and in massing, have something that has a more imposing elegance. And with Palladio, this is, this is a conceit. It, it, he's very aware that, that, that this representation isn't something that's done because he's in the countryside and to use stone is, is, is less expensive or more expedient. This is completely uh, faked. And I'm really interested in this idea of honesty and uh, fiction uh, and the fictive because uh, in architecture in, in, in the 20th century, modernism was a norm and the modernism became the idea of the machine for living and the idea of honesty and structural integrity. And if you scratch something, it should be the same material all the way through. But actually, what Palladio was showing here is that he gives the conceit that a singular giant column is made up of these individual multiple stones, massive stones. It's almost like a giant went out and picked from the garden and laid one on top of the other. He even bevels the edges of the stones. You can almost feel the gravity, the weight of each one bearing down on top of the other and pushing it out. But this is this is a conceit. Uh, the reality of it is, is that to make this column would probably be more expensive than the finer, elegant, more fluted columns that you would have seen in the urban palazzo villas, where you would have made from brick and stucco to do the fluting. Here, these stones with a cost to put on top and uh, to lift and to carve would have been more expensive. But Palladio recognizes that the image is more important than the, the truth about the construction or the tectonic. This is an installation by uh, Peter Fisley and David Weiss. This is, I think, uh, they did a series of these installations in the 80s and 90s uh, at these polyurethane sculptures. And this is one from the Tate Modern. Uh, on first glance, the installation appears to display everyday items from the artist's studio. You have a, a sort of as found collection of roller brushes, boxes, bits and pieces from uh, the a studio, from the workshop. But however, the reality is that what looks like everyday as found items is actually each one of these elements is hand carved polyurethane and hand painted to appear like manufactured everyday items. Uh, the illusion of the mass produced item within the artist studio is, is, is then transported to the gallery envi environment. What I like about it is that it pretends it's not an artwork. It has multiple readings uh, again. So it pretends it's not an artwork, it's a critic of art history and obviously talks about uh, the idea of the ready maids and Marshall Duchamp. And it also is, is, is a critique of process versus completion. Uh, Peter Fishy described these objects as, as phantoms. Uh, phantoms, he described them as that term because he believed that they were there in terms of their visual terms, but not in terms of a touch because obviously what they look like, look at like one thing, but obviously if you go closer and you expand them and the haptic quality of them, it isn't that. And, and for me, what this, why I showed a slide and what interests me and my architecture is what I talked about with Palladio, this idea between reality or perception in architecture, the truth and honesty versus the representation or the fiction. And I think uh, in architecture, the, the idea between the architectural idea versus the architectural experience, and for me, the architectural experience is what's more important. So I guess in other words, saying that is between the architectural concept and the architectural experience. Really, for me, it's how one experiences the building is the most important thing because that's how we feel architecture. 
it's not uh, it's not it's not an intellectual uh, uh, process or not sorry can we let intellectual process but it's not an intellectual experience but experience is, is emotive and it's atmospheric so in my own architecture this is something that I think is what could be considered what officially advised or called in the phantom in in the way that this is a, a wall building but it pretending to be a stick building due to economic reasons. So it's a building that's made from planar walls, but it's pretending to be a filigree-like object because the filigree-like object has a representational quality of the conservatory. Uh, this project was actually a very small project, was for a client who came to me who was going to buy a off-the-shelf proprietary conservatory, and those high-end conservatories are quite expensive, they're around 50,000 uh, euro or pound. And I said, well, I think for the same amount of money that we could make you something bespoke that would be planned to your needs. But we also wanted to, to evoke the quality of the idea. This is to a, a small Edwardian house, so the, of the idea of the Edwardian orangery, but obviously in suburbia, also the ubiquitous PVC conservatory. So you have the high and the low. And we wanted this to be kind of talked about in the architecture and how you experience it. But we couldn't have the money to make a stick building. We didn't have the money to make something that could be glazed quite heavily. So using articulation and elaboration, we tried to make the conservatory room, which is the space at the back. We tried to make it from very much uh, using uh, everyday builders items, but assembled in a way and elaborated in a way that made them feel special. This comes down to an idea in my practice, which we were researching through an arts grant, an idea called the Ridgely Economic. And the first part of that is really true using elaboration, like how George and the Victorians would use that to move away from the modernist belief in, in, in the middle and very perfect construction that was required from very minimal detailing. It's something where you design through tolerance and elaboration. And that enables something to potentially, from very expedient and simple means, for something to feel a bit more richer and more uh, depth to it. So, for instance, these blockwork walls I talked about in terms of that was a wall construction, rather than them all being just stretched or coarse laid, the, the inner blockwork wall was just laid in a way that expressed, uh, or sorry, laid in a way that uh, defined shape and articulation by how the block was laid, whether it be laid on its flat, whether it be laid on the soldier course, or stretcher in between. Similarly, for this project in, in for the conservatory room, all the elements that could be bought off the shelf, uh, I mean roof lights, double glazing units, doors, we, we bought them off the shelf. So we had a certain amount of things that could be shop bought, but then we recognized that anything that then needed to be constructed on site, uh, the assembly, well, that's where we could put our effort so that the elaboration would happen in the pieces that had to be made, be it the block work that had to be laid. So we put the effort into design how one would lay the block work and similarly into the joists that would span across the room. So the joists that would generally span perpendicular to the walls, we looked at, well, what if we spanned them at, at 45 degrees and to form some sort of coffer and that this could then be elaborated so that the space through the same material expression could have a, a, a richer understanding for, for, for someone as they experience the space. Uh, something else we we're interested with with this project is the idea within the rich economic of, of building with tolerance. So as I said, there's a kind of a belief that to build cheaply, you build honestly, you use, you know, there's this kind of uh, austere chic, I call it, people build walls with plywood walls or, or expressed uh, block work or brick work. But, the reality of that is that I've, from past experience, I kind of understood that the reality of that is that to use those materials and to express them visually and to express them rawly visually means that they have to be laid very, very carefully. And actually in the 21st century or only in the 21st century, in the 20th century even, what has happened in construction costs is that construction costs have flipped from materials once being a cheap thing to the late, uh, uh, sorry, materials being an expensive item to labor being cheap nowadays it's relatively that labor is the most expensive element and material is cheap so what we try to do is we try to build in a way 
where we reduce the amount of labor on site, reduce the amount of, 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 of craft so that this building can be built very quickly uh, with a local job in builder. We're not trying to find someone that's highly skilled. And we use tolerance to allow it to be built quickly. And then we use tolerance to then uh, to, uh, to cloak it. So by tolerance, I mean, we use items like paint, color, renders, all the things that the Victorians and Jordans did when you have a skirt in and to mass a messy detail, that modernism removed by suddenly wanting to have a very simple looking space. But of course, if you have a wall that meets a floor with nothing to uh, conceal a junction, that junction has to be laid very perfectly. And nowadays with labor, that means the cost, cost to craft that is exorbitantly high, which takes architecture out of the suburbs and takes architecture out of the kind of world of the everyday and it suddenly becomes architecture for the patrons, which is something that I'm not so interested in, or it's something that I think that it's, it's, it needs to, we need architecture to become part of our everyday culture, especially in the UK. So it's not just that architecture is seen as something for, uh, as expense onto the house, but architecture is seen as something that adds value onto the house. So you can see here how it's built. The structure of this building is quite crude. You can see how like the, the builder has built with lots of uh, snots and you know very crudely put together blocks cut where they need them. But then we understood that, well, rather than exposing the brickwork as some architects would like to do, or the blockwork in this case, and there is a, an element where you want to expose the blockwork because you can say it has a nice pattern and it has a nice figure to it. But we recognized that we didn't have the cost to do that. We didn't have the budget to do that. So we then looked at using renders to then over, over apply onto it so that the articulation is expressed in the structure. And then we do use render and paints and color as a way to detract from maybe what might be the more uh, expediently put up. So for instance, where you can see the joists have been put up uh, where the gaps are, where the joints are so uh, quickly put together. It starts to, with a deeper green paint, those corners start to recess into the background, and suddenly those joints aren't the important thing. It's the overall effect of the space and the ceiling and this net above you, which reads. Then I won't go into in detail too much of this project, but then also understanding that, like, how something can be read in two different ways from a structure that can be contained within the room to then a structure when it contains, when it goes outside, the same structure is outside, but suddenly because of its different constraints with regard to environment, with regard to uh, weathering, because it's now external space rather than internal space, you can then articulate something differently so that, uh, so that one uh, element can be almost read in two flavors. So you get this internal ceiling as a cover, excuse me, and you get this visual pergola when it goes outside and we take off the insulation as a place where plants can grow up and eventually grow over. Similarly, the, the uh, walls in this outdoor space, they go down between the pilasters, they drop down to the height of the neighboring wall, which also enables light to go through. So they go from being pilasters to being, uh, to being these kind of uh, submerged columns. Uh, this is a photograph I took near a project I'm doing in London. And um, why I show this slide is because I want to talk about the idea of my practice of gestalt. So in my practice, we never really have a, uh, we, we really try to avoid a singular idea in a project or an idea of what is a project about. But instead we build up our projects iteratively, layer by layer, uh, working through. Uh, it's the idea of gestalt where the whole, uh, experience the whole entity is greater than some of the individual parts and i think by not trying to have a, a a gimmick or not trying to have a singular thesis or a singular idea about a project it makes the 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 architecture experience richer uh, i really like architecture where maybe on, only on the second or the third visits you experience something or how a socket might be laid or how how uh, some uh, skirting boards are joined. It's not things that shout at you or not things that kind of like demand your attention, but it's things that reveal themselves slowly. Uh, and how we work iteratively in, in the practice is almost like how you'd hear, I think from your secondary school teacher when they talk about how a Renaissance sculptor would get a piece of marble and that marble would have folds and have strengths within the block 
And because of those folds of strength, they could either decide it's going to be a standing statue or a pieta lying down. And certainly with our projects, we use context and constraints to enable us to design uh, almost uh, almost blindfoldedly, where we're, 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 we're simply conducting the elements rather than leading with a, with a, with a first principle. Uh, this, this painted gable, what I like about it is that obviously this is a, a, a 20th century housing estate in, in, in London and the gable has a very nice proportion to it, but it's made of these individual, uh, not individual, but it's made up of, of, of a brick surface with uh, multiple uh, toned bricks of red, red, brown, uh, and a darker sub black. And what I like about it is that obviously this wall has been graffitied at some point and the council have come and they've reacted to the graffiti in terms of they've looked to overpaint it, but they've reacted to the graffiti based on the brickwork wall behind. So they've picked a tone of the brick and they've over painted the artist's graffiti. Then obviously the graffiti artist has come back. He's seen that the council have painted the wall, probably got a bit annoyed and says, oh, I'm going to go again. So he's gone again and he's painted more graffiti over there, over painting. And then for some reason, the council has come back and they've picked, oops, uh, they've picked another tone of brickwork and they've overpainted the graffiti again, but they overpainted in the module of the brick. So you start to kind of get all these contingencies or all these elements that are potentially not related to each other, but they're starting to build up almost like how a watercolor would wash, a watercolor painter would wash up a watercolor thing. So that what you're left with, I, I think it's quite a beautiful wall, but it, it hasn't been a forced idea. It's been an idea that's been built up through process, through chance to some degrees, but also I guess through conducting where, for instance, a council here have seen that the graffiti is a certain shape and then they fill in the block work to the module of the brick, sorry, fill in the brickwork paint into the module of the brick. And I, I really like this work and this is how we work in our office. We, we build up our projects slowly, reacting to what went before us. Uh, sometimes the next step can completely contrast with the step that went before us and it can obliterate that idea. Sometimes the step can harmonize with it and it can take it forward. But I think project successful where at the end, if the result that you had from the end and the result you had from the beginning are, you, you, you didn't know how they join together or you, you can't see how they link up. I think that is a natural way of working without a forced idea, without a forced agenda, but letting uh, being the architect as, as almost a conductor. <clears throat> this is a house we did in uh, Dublin. This is one of the two projects that we have built. We have a couple more on site, which I hope to finish this year. So we're excited about, but uh, this is uh, a house uh, for a family in Dublin. And I'll try to explain this project through the idea of Gestalt and the idea of iteration and how the project developed and how there really isn't any singular idea to it, but actually it's, it's, a, it's built up of cinegraphic moments. And it's a bit, it's funny showing it in a lecture because I think when you start to pull out all the moments, the project starts to feel really like like a bit intense. But I think when you actually are there and you experience it, all those individual moments come go to the background. Some people don't pick them up at all. Some people pick them up. And I hope that you get the experience of the project that it feels as a unified whole rather than these cinegraphic moments that I'll talk about at the moment. But the site itself was located at the end of a 1940s terrace. Uh, it's about a mile outside Dublin city centre in a, a typically suburban uh, context. Uh, you have the state road running down through here, but there's a slight unusual quality that there's a laneway that ran behind our site. The houses on the estate are made up of, uh, in a typical suburban fashion, of, of a front and rear garden. And this site was actually the garden of number 80, the adjacent house to it. What was interesting was the owner of this site at number 80 had applied for three planning permissions to develop the site for the same, for a two story three bedroom house, which is the same uh, specification of the house that we build here in the end. But they were looking at trying to just simply take the pattern book of these houses and to force it onto the site without trying to acknowledge how 
design needed to be translated from the suburban uh, typology, which had some nice qualities, but they weren't conducting it in a way, in a certain way they're being pastiche and trying to just lay it down on top. When we went visited the site, we were really inspired by what doesn't look bad inspiring an overgrown garden. But what we liked about it was that there was this connection to the suburbia outside, which was glimpsed from the road above the hedgerows. But there was also this privacy, which is contained by this kind of almost secret garden world. And what we were interested in, or what we noted, was that the planners, when they refused planning an application for the two previous submissions by a previous architects was due to the lack of outdoor space or the lack of private outdoor amenity, which is basically garden space. And we were interested in that because then that meant for us that we had this quite, uh, quite interesting garden condition. And we were coming to, well, if the garden was a problem for the planners, we should make the project part of the project should be about how one interacts with a garden or how one works with a garden. And that became our first stepping stone into this project. Uh, the plan of the project, the plan of the project is basically a, a cross-shaped core, which is basically a, a political political plan that forms four public rooms that are divided by a shop cross-shaped core. Uh, the four public rooms are an entrance hallway, which has a, a bookshelf and, and which is has glass back, which lights a bathroom behind, uh, a dining room, kitchen, dining space, as you call it, kitchen space, and then a, a living space. All the ancillary functions for these public spaces, and when I say public spaces, I probably mean the representational spaces of the house, uh, or the spaces, uh, the reception rooms of the house. But then all the ancillary spaces for these rooms, like uh, WC, staircase, door, kitchen units, fireplace, they're all held within this cross-shaped core. The cross-shaped core also uh, contains all the structure for the house, because we we're interested that if the idea of the garden was uh, something that had become important to the project, is allowed us by putting all the structure into the cross, allowed us to wrap the perimeter, excuse me, on nearly all sides in a timber and glass screen. We are interested also when we're looking at the planning of this house in the idea of, I guess, a 20th century idea of open plan and then maybe the more historical or traditional uh, idea of the suburban round plan. And I'm not even talking about round plan in terms of Victorian or Georgian houses, I'm talking about round plan in terms of the suburbia, where you'd enter in, you'd have your dining room, you have your kitchen, you have your stair core, and how these are kind of uh, ventricular type cellular spaces. And what we're interested in this plan is there should be an ambiguity between something that someone can recognize potentially from suburbia, from these houses as rooms, but also that someone can recognize maybe more uh, contemporary living as, as the open and uh, interconnected spaces. So we saw this plan both as, as round plan and plan libre. And by that, I mean that on the ground floor, there are no doors that divide the reception rooms from each other. And there's continuous, uh, it's a continuous route around. But this, the thresholds are defined by steps and sections, which I'll talk about later. The plan on the ground floor is quite small, it's only 55 square meters. But by having this uh, continuous loop of circulation around the perimeter, it means that the house, although small, has its ever expanding quality as you can go from room to room to room to room, and obviously it doesn't stop. Uh, and if there's children in this house, you, you notice that quite a lot. Uh, yeah, so let's start to see where I am my notes. With regard to the planning, the idea of why we wanted this timber and glass screen was that there should be a, a flexibility or, or, or a chance moment to change the house so that one could on a fine days open these uh, timber and glass doors so that the actual plan of the house on fine days would reduce down to just this cross-shaped core and the garden could then be uh, allowed to spread inside the house from all of the sides. So that meant in terms of overcoming the planning and the planning idea was that we argued that on fine days when the garden needs to be of a certain scale, it needs to be of a certain generosity that these doors can be folded back. 
as you can see in these images, so that the uh, so that the house and the garden, uh, the idea, the the, the 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 definition between what is indoor and what is outdoor is blurred. We weren't so interested in the idea of taking indoors, outdoors, or those kind of dualities. But it's more this idea of blending uh, of a synthesis, so that actually the, the walls of your room aren't necessarily these timber and glass screen walls, but actually are the walls of the garden itself. And that affected the materiality of these ground floor spaces because they were seen, we wanted them to be seen both, and this is a Robert Venturi idea, this idea of both and where something can have multiple readings and then the richness you get from that. But here the idea is that we wanted the floor to be almost like a patio floor. So we had a, a struck concrete, we couldn't afford to grind it. Uh, so it was just simply a struck concrete floor, but then to elaborate it or to, again, to almost counter the idea of the patio, we inlaid uh, Carrera marble tiles almost as a, as a Palladian type marble or other leverance type marble as a, where, so because we couldn't grind down to see the individual stone chippings, these tiles are almost like a, a perfectly formed aggregate that could be viewed on it, but also it, it was a place that could uh, enable habitation. It was, it was like a petrified rug or a petrified carpet that could define where a chair or, or, or table could go. When the, the doors slide back, uh, the folding doors all slide back to the apexes of the cross. What we liked about this is that this ambiguity between this being neither an indoor or an outdoor space is really made evident because to get from one room to the other, you have to go underneath the soffit and then back in and around. So that connection, that little connection to the outdoors is, is very immediate and very explicit. When we were working on the house, we had an opportunity to visit the Southern House by the Smithsons. And it, it has similar ideas in terms of a room that's made of, I would consider about round plan and plan libre in terms of that there's, a, there's very much defined spaces, but even in an overall volume of, of, of a singular whole. And what was interesting in that project when I was there was the experience of the ceiling heights. So they define the different spaces by subtle changes in the ceiling heights. They keep the floor levels constant, but then you have a compression for a kitchen that then opens up onto the space that leads out into the garden. And then these zones, although it's one space and visually connected, you start to kind of inhabit them in different ways and the intimacies change as you, as you walk around the house. This is something we wanted to introduce with our project as well. I've kind of alluded to it in, in the plan drawing, but we looked here at using stepping the section and using the section to define the thresholds between the rooms. So obviously one would step up to enter up, enter into the house and that's into the lower space before one would step down again into the kitchen dining, which is on grade with the garden, before one would step down further three more steps to this uh, north facing, northwest facing, uh drawing room or our living room which uh has a window seat with a garden has a different quality to the garden that's south facing the idea with the ground floor then is that by keeping the ceiling horizontal or flat as you say there's this kind of horizontal emphasis on the ground floor that's then countered with this vertical emphasis that we get then on the first floor uh section and the spaces on the first floor if I just go through the house, I was hoping to put in more pictures of it and have it, but I have some funny ones, but I haven't had a chance to put them in yet. But this is when you enter into the house and you step up into this lobby space. This is that bookshelf that has glass behind it that lights into the bathroom. And that's kind of meant to be like, almost like the, the name of the house. So when you enter in, you see the interests of the owner, you see what books they're reading, what art they like. And there's also a kind of witty connotation or not witty is my right word it's a, a joke and in joke that obviously the more books you take away you can start to expose the privacy of the, of the bathroom uh, then this is a space looking the back down towards the dining room so I'll, I'll take you around the loop of the house so this is where you just entered in that door then you step down into the dining space with some of the sliding doors pulled back this is that dining space with the, the table on, on top of the uh, of the petrified rug before you turn around, you're turning around where the kitchen is and that leg, apex of the leg takes you into the kitchen space. That's then when one looks back, when doors are folded back, you can't have uh, the dining space in front with the uh, 
kitchen here with these doors that's stacked that you have to go around to actually the working part of the kitchen before you go uh, down some steps into the living space. What, what I like about it uh, is that this the line between the interior and the exterior gets diminished to 50 millimeters. It's, it's the thickness of a door. And the quality of when they're opened up is not really trying to bring the garden indoors, but always just acknowledge that actually the, the house is neither one or the other, it's both. And I, I like that then, obviously, how that can be expressed. I've seen the shadows, you get the flowers and, and on the floor, et cetera. Uh, then this is the space where you're coming from down from the kitchen. You step down a couple more steps into the living space, which is sunken. And I don't know if you can see in this image, but there are these large uh, frieze done on the walls, painted in, in acrylic and uh, varnish, which is something I'm interested in, this idea of how something can be bold, but at the same time can be almost invisible, depending on how you view it and depending on how you see it. I don't know if I can another slide later on where we can see that. And this is looking back down, down at that uh, living space, the, the sunken garden and then the window seat going around. And then these are the three steps that take you back up to the hole where we start our journey from the beginning. This idea of this, I guess, the, the multiple readings and the duality of things. What I like about this is the Corbusier apartment in France. What I like about it is that there, it's made up of elements that we recognize. So we recognize the fireplace, we recognize the chair, we recognize nature, grass, we, we recognize the Eiffel Tower, that's different. But how you assemble them and how you arrange them makes something seem special and unique and exciting. And I guess that idea is something I wanted to bring into this house. So you can see the you can see the uh, the wall decoration a bit more clearly there. You, it's quite nice that you only what's something that's quite loud. You only get to see it in certain lights, and then it disappears again. And I think that is the idea I like about this thing about having only a second or a third reading or something that you only see on occasion. But here you can see the uh, latest garden has really come up now. I look at these pictures, this garden is so much more grown up. It's, it's, it's nicer now, but uh, there's a nice aspect that you can be in your living room, but at the same time camping, you know, there's a, there's a curtain that wraps around the space. So you can have the fire on, but at the same time, a bit like the, very like the Caruse, or a version or a reference of the Caruse project, uh, where you have, it's something that is both within and both without. And you get to enjoy it because of those both qualities. That's why you, people like to go camping, I think, is because like you, you experience heat and you're experiencing cooking in a way and the surroundings that is, is special and unique. And I, I guess in some ways we, we would like to think that this project contains some of those elements. Like when we use references in the pro process, we, we obviously use architectural references, known architectural references. But we, we also are very interested in just looking around, just looking at the everyday and uh, picking up the qualities of, of architecture, vernacular, uh, they can be art references, but just seeing things and trying to take the qualities of them that we like and trying to amplify the elements that we like or rearrange the elements that we like to make something seem newly familiar, I guess. This is uh, an installation by Joseph Kossler called uh, One of Three Chairs. And I guess what I like about this is that he shows how, how you represent something or how you, you show something. It can be the same item, but whether it's, it's, it's real or whether it's a photograph or whether it's text, it describes something, but you understand it differently by how you're viewing it and, and, and how you read it. Uh, and I like that in architecture. This is Robert Venturi's Trubeck house, where he again is taking elements that we recognize from the everyday, like windows and porches, but it's, it's how he assembles them and how he arranges them that makes it special. So a window that looks like a window from the outside is actually not, it's a, it's a, it's a separate screen to a window, which is behind the exaggeration of the porch and the amplification of the porch, give it a quality that is like, I describe this almost like a, a school kid who, uh, you know, he, he goes to school and he wears his uniform, but like he has his tie messed up and he has his shirt hanging out. So he's a little bit punk. So it, it's kind of, uh, he is part of the school system. When we look at him, you can see him in the uniform, 
but at the same time, he's he he he's he stands aside from it, and, and I think that's a very nice thing to have in architecture, where you have you can you can go in from having associations to being your own thing, from having associations to being your own thing, and I think that means that a, a project can be can be uh, appreciated by not just the client and the owner, but it can be appreciated and have, it should be appreciated, and not it should be it, it should have an equal responsibility to the client, but equally it's, architecture needs to have a responsibility to just the passerby who's walking by it and to the visitor who's just visiting it. All those people who maybe not always paying your fees, but they also have, you have to think about them when you're making your architecture as well, not just solely the, so that's why I mean that the interior can have a representation that might be suited to the, the client or the user, but the exterior might have a representation that's more suited to the passerby. And when I say the passerby, I really guess, I mean the city, and uh, the representation of quality of a building to the city and the context and, and how one, one appreciates it in the society. Uh, but this is an example of the arts and craft houses where, where also there were experts in using elements that were recognizable like chimneys, uh, uh, downpipes, eaves and hips, but how they arrange them and how they compose them would make something feel much more figurative, much more sculptural in quality, which lifts it from just being the everyday to something that has a uh, something that has more depth and more richness to it. And that's something that we try to do in the uh, house in Dublin. So when we were looking at the, the, the context of around us, the neighbours were pebble dash houses, and we were interested in looking at pebble dashing and how we could look at render and pebble dashing in, in some ways going back to the idea of richly economical, so we could just build this building in a steel frame, put up block work and then render it. And then like almost like how chefs did cooking in the 1990s where they'd have tomatoes, three ways. We were kind of like, okay, what if we did render three ways or something like that. But like, the idea is that here we have a, a render, which is a bulk proprietary product. We add stones into it, but we don't just try to pastiche the pebble dash. We try to make it into something it's more than. We were looking at uh, the sculptures of, of, of Hans Jotterson, uh, and how they have this almost wet, like their, their solid bronze sculptures, they'll have this almost wet-like quality to them. And that's something that we wanted to have in our pebble dash, that although it was petrified, it almost had this oozing like quality, almost like a lava. We wanted then that to be somehow that the exterior was only talking about a tonal quality. So it's all of the, sorry, textual quality. So tonally, it was all the same from the smooth render, which is the same render as this, because with the stones removed and hand trowel with a steel trowel to then the timber joinery that was then stained with a light gray stain. So the exterior only becomes about uh, texture. And then elaboration. So these are the tiles we use for the, it's a, a tegral tile, it's quite a cheap fiber cement tile, but we looked at trying to exaggerate the fixing. So these are crampions that are stuck underneath, but we overscale them and we also put them in the top. So suddenly the, the fixings have this second order onto the order of the tiles so that the, the tiles just aren't simply a way of, 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 uh, of holding the roof, but they also have a certain amount of a decorative quality, you could say to them. But in terms of that, I guess it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a visual interest. And I, that comes from an idea, we also talk about quite a lot in my practice of the idea of the applied arts, where something is done not necessarily solely for the functional quality of it, but for an aesthetic reason. So it, it doesn't bring anything functionally benefit to a project or to a uh, to to a piece of 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 of, uh, of uh, like say for instance a, a cup or anything like that how a, how a handle could be ornate but because the handle has an ornate it gives you a secondary it gives you an element of richness it's something that I guess I felt was kind of stripped out during modernist architecture I guess this is a comment this is a, a sculpture by Bertrand Lavier which kind of talks about this idea of the applied arts where uh, it's using everyday items and how they're arranged and how they're assembled makes something that we know makes it feel special and exciting and you get to look at it again. So this is a fountain he did for the Serpentine in London made from hose pipes, but it suddenly becomes this very joyful and delightful element because not just because it's made because of the color, but it's because of our association. We see something that we recognize, we start to see it in, in an unusual assembly. So it becomes something of more interest to us. This is a project that we're finishing in Walthamstow at the moment. Uh, and it, it's a simple uh, extension, very small. Uh, it's a timber clad building. But again, here we were interested in how the applied arts could be used. So on 
the size of the building that are non-representational, the size of the building, the extension, which are either in close proximity that, to uh, the existing buildings so you don't get to read them, or that they're either the, the, the rear end of the building or a courtyard here. We just simply painted them all white. But where the building was fronting onto the garden and you had distance and you had view back to it, we looked at how we could elaborate the timber, looked at how we could, and the timber, these are uh, uh, those paints from Sweden, fellow and raw type paints, which are used to uh, waterproof the paint, or timber, I should say. But we looked at how rather than just painting the surfaces in a single paint, how we could look at painting each of the surfaces of the, of the timber in a different color or a different tone, so that as we stripped away the timber cladding, the, what is quite a shallow depth of tectonic or of structure, which is only three boards thick, uh, becomes something because of the color that has more prominence, more interest. Similarly, uh, this idea of the applied arts, I guess you could say, is in the roof of this project or in the ceiling structure, which is made from METSEC beams. METSEC beams are agricultural beams are very inexpensive. And we looked, we could have held the ceiling up <clears throat> possibly with six beams, but we were interested in how actually, well, because they're an expensive item, if we multiply the number of them, this is a house for an engineer as well. So we're really interested in the idea or the joke of redundancy in this project that something's there not just because it's efficient and it works but something's there to give an atmosphere and create a quality so the ceiling here for instance could be made from six beams but it's made from 36 beams that are built up in one layer on the bottom and then another layer on top which cross over it and then roof lights above so the beams have a certain functional purpose in terms of that they diffuse light but what we liked about it more so is that it felt like you had this boat at one point delicate but also heavy structure above your head Similarly, how we arrayed the lights again, we looked at trying to array them in a way that the light became not just when it was on something to light a room, but how it was arrayed becomes something that could give uh, a certain uh, energy or a certain uh, enliveness or richness to the space. We also looked at color here and we use color here to somehow try to join the existing space and the new space, we weren't interested in them feeling uh, separate. We want them to feel like one room, hence why the floor is the same, because we use paint to kind of somehow link the spaces across where we couldn't put in a new ceiling. We use paint to kind of give the impression of a draped ceiling and where we could put uh, a new ceiling in, obviously we were able to drape it in, in this metsec beam. So this is back to the house in Dublin, uh, where in the main bedroom, uh, all the pitches of the roof all pictures of the upstairs rooms follow the roof line, but in the main bedroom, we looked at uh, curving the plasterboard, not for any functional benefit, but for the association and a reference to, I guess, like, like the Schinkel project or the tent bedroom, or just being in a tent because there's a quality to that billowing that one associates with calming, or one associates with relaxing, which seems appropriate for a space of sleep. So although potentially it doesn't, functionally work aesthetically and referentially and atmospherically, I guess almost in how architecture communicates, we go back to our point at the start, we're trying to do that with these projects as well. Uh, I don't know how I'm doing on time, I might quickly glance over some of these items. This is just talking about how when we design in, in small stages, it means that actually that the really, you can really kind of enjoy and we really enjoy how maybe minor elements, like maybe it's not the stone that you lay, but it's actually the, the joint or the grout you put between the stone that becomes exciting. Or similarly, in this case for the window, we were interested in it wasn't actually the window that we were making that was exciting us, but it's how we were actually glazing or, or, or using glazing beads to hold the glass in place. So here we looked at trying to exaggerate or overscale the glazing bead and then using the glass, using the glazing bead to hold the glass in place. It also get, with these exaggerated fixings, starting to give a second order to the frame. So, so from when you're in the room, you start to read these L-shaped pieces that can pivot around a window door because those L-shaped pieces also associated with this not being a stick material, but this being a sheet material that you've cut out of. And it's not something that's important. It's not something that you need to know, but it's hopefully maybe on your second or third or fourth visit, something that you can pick up. And it's just something that 
you may or may not have interest in, but it's it's another small iterative process and sort of another small adult richness. Uh, this is the elevation of the house to the rear. Uh, again, we're looking at this idea of the applied arts and how one can use uh, functional items like uh, downpipes and gutters, not just in a way to uh, as a means to an end, but also as a way where a facade might have a stretch that felt the composition felt uneven. You can use a downpipe, almost like a line drawing or a painterly drawing to balance off the composition. And we're also interested in this in terms of you looking at how the house has this fiction of maybe it was always there, maybe it was, maybe it's a new house, maybe, and so there's this ambiguity to it. So you're never quite sure. And I think that's like what we didn't want this project to feel like was to look where the new piece of architecture on the end of the road. We wanted it to feel like it was somehow a cousin to these neighbors around it. And how, uh, how we try to do these things, how we try to have these multiple readings is we try to get things to work twice as hard for us or, or, or to have double entendre or what's the word? Uh, I might come back to me. Uh, synonyms. So something that can something that can look like something, but it can mean something else, or it can have two two meanings. Like you know, uh, so for instance, this looks like a chimney, and it is a chimney, but it's also a roof light that lights the center of this plan, which is in the deep, the darkest part that would have been the darkest part of the house. This is that space here. So basically, when you go up the stairs, up one of the legs of the cross-shaped core, you arrive in the space that's one door wide and two doors in length. It's almost like being in a very compressed, it's almost like being within a wardrobe. And it's lined up to door heights or feels almost like a wardrobe. But then you have this extrusion that then takes you up five meters to this roof light. That's obviously like a, a sort of James Terrell take on this light coming from above to light this space. So that's looking up at that stair. At these kind of at this landing that had one door deep and two doors in, in width, but then this roof light above you, which is quite nice that you're in the center of the plan, but you're still connected to the elements outside. You're still connected to nature. You still know the time of day and the passing of day. I think that's quite nice to have that connection. Uh, in this project, each of the elevations was slightly tuned. I'm, I'm, I'm nervous of time, so I'm just going to quickly pass by. Similarly here, because of the because of the existing condition with the hedge and the height of the hedge meant that the first floor had a, a reaction to the neighbors, but it meant that the ground floor could have a separate reaction because of the existing hedge. It meant that the ground floor could have a quality that because if the existing hedge wasn't there, we'd never build a glass house on the ground floor if the existing hedge was there, but because the existing hedge was there, it allowed one, for better, one or better word, build a glass house on the ground floor and then build a much more enclosed space on the first floor that relates to the houses around it. And we played with things like, uh, we played with things like uh, the flushness of the glazing on the ground. The glass here is all structurally bonded and, and, and slick and flush. And then the depth of the windows, these private bedrooms on the top floor. And again, using downpipes and canopies to just enable the house to, to have a, 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 a more painterly composition, especially when we thought that without that downpipe that was here, we thought that that facade felt uh, it felt dull or it felt too stretched because it was it's actually it's um, not at right angles to the plan. So it, because in perspective it is not at right angles, it flattens very quickly. So the downpipe gives it uh, it enriches it somewhat. It's just a view looking back from the laneway or from the that uh, space in front. That's just looking at the house as you enter in. I won't talk about it too much, but these are picking up on this is photographed by Lewis Bultz, who's again talks wonderfully about how uh, these are just photographs of him going around LA, but seeing how everyday elements of servicing of doors, how something can be composed into a, a picturesque or, 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 or painterly quality. And that's something that in architecture I find sometimes gets taken away, where we look, architects might focus a lot on the spatial and the and the material qualities of a room. We don't really necessarily engage with the elements of servicing, the elements of, like for instance, sockets and switches, and how they can be arrayed in a way, that, in a manner that is not just uh, application, and also to really sustainable projects. Like, you no, know, I, I hate seeing projects that just have PVs placed on the roof. Like, you know, uh, I'll talk about that later in another project. But there's a way where environmental pro uh, environmental 
applications to become building fabric. But what I'm interested in is that these become these elements are all thought of as architecture. It's not just architecture and applications, it's all thought holistically of architecture. And that's what we would like to try in our projects. Uh, this is a painting which I really like, Rocco. And I guess this talks about the idea of why I like work, working up in layers. Uh, this is uh, green on black in, in the Country Museum in Basel. And what I like about it is that when you enter into the gallery space and you see it, it's kind of located diagonally from your entrance. And uh, when you see it in the gallery space at the start, how you react to the piece is in relation to how it sits and it's in relation to the floor, the artwork around it. It's, it seems like uh, an opaque object. It feels like this black object on the wall that has a relationship to the things that are around it. But as you get closer to it, you can see that how actually Rocco has built up this piece. It's not actually a singular black uh canvas but instead it's being built up in layers upon layers of paint so what looks like a single opaque piece is actually something that has a lot a lot of depth to it because of these because of these individual washes that go to go up off it, on top of it so when you get up close suddenly the screen square gets revealed inside it and what i like about that in terms of how that can relate back to architecture is that if one builds up in these uh layers one can have an architecture that can work at different scales. So it can happen and it can mean different things at different scales. Like this rock of painting to me means different things to it at different scales to me from the scale of the gallery room. And you see this opaque object in relation to the artwork around it to the scale of one to one when you're in immediate contact with it and suddenly the painting reveals its depth to you. But I think in terms of architecture, how that can be related as regard to uh, the scale of the city how you can understand the building in terms of scale of the city. And then that can be different than how you understand the building in a scale of one to one, or how you use a handle to enter, or how, uh, how a handrail can feel in your hand. Now, the title uh, project, uh, of the lecture was First Thoughts. And I just wanted to describe how these first thoughts are also something that's, in some ways are coincidental, but then in some ways become themes that we take through into other projects in the office. So this is for a, a small housing, uh, development we're working on in, in at the moment in the, in the office. It's for uh, four houses and the refurbishment of an existing house. But uh, what I want to talk about is that it's it's uh, based really in its first step. It was based on the plan to a degree of the Clontarf Dublin house that I was just talking about, which is this kind of cross-shaped core with this, within these courtyards uh, perimeters. And what we're interested in, in this project was trying to define these outdoor rooms. So when we were making this development, when we were engaging with the planners, we weren't really talking about the architecture as the built elements. We were talking about the architecture as being the walls to make these different outdoor rooms from a, a laneway, a public laneway that can define a threshold, which is a shared space between these four units, to uh, a garden space, which is the amenity that's accessed off the public rooms, or represent take our, our reception rooms of the house, to uh, uh, an internal courtyard. So unlike the Contarf house, which has four rooms going around it, it's just three rooms and one of the rooms has been given over to this internal courtyard, which is uh, roofed over with metsec to form a, 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 a type of pergola. Uh, and what we were interested in this project was that there was, taking its cue from the Holly, uh, Hollybrook house, was that there was no real hierarchy between what was an indoor or an outdoor room, that they all have a similar equivalent. So when we cut a plan like this, a garden room like this, oh, sorry, uh, a garden like this has equivalence to a living room like this, has equivalence to an outdoor court like this, has an equivalence to the shared space like this. So it's a matrix of rooms of ventricular chambers, I guess, in terms of how they beat into each other. But then these chambers, uh, these chambers are sometimes covered and they're sometimes open. Uh, as I said, when we were talking to the planners, we were really focusing on, on how these outdoor rooms, the qualities and the proportion of these outdoor rooms can be. So that a space that might feel tight, which is it might be only three meters across. But if we talk about it in terms of typology, we start to re relate it to things that we associate with having good qualities, like, you know, uh, uh, a suburban laneway or, or, or these, these alleys, these collegial kind of alleys that we find in, in, in Oxford or in Cambridge. I was trying to see that, well, although this is dimensionally or empirically might be 
thought of it as a tight space by how one elaborates it, by how one materially defines it. It can be something that can have a generosity where you can actually steal a bit of sky through a window into someone's garden that they can either open or close depending on, on the privacy requirements or you get a bit of foliage or a leaf from a garden beyond. So it's about having these moments that are both individual but also shared. When you kind of arrive at the space where one uh, departs into your dwelling proper, we kind of have a, a threshold that's set up as a space that's shared, but then we have these kind of cuts into the building that allow space that one can step out into. If you're still covered by your house and you still feel within your private world, you can slip back into it quite quickly, but it, it's trying to tune the house to these intimacies of these public, not public outdoor rooms, but outdoor spaces, because I really think the architecture it's maybe a bit of a cliche now, but the space that you form between is actually very important. Uh, then these are just views looking back at this project and how it relates to the surroundings. Trying to tune it with the neighbours, so again, and once it feels newly familiar, so it's something that has connotations with its surroundings, but at the same time, it, it starts to uh, react against them or, 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 or exaggerate itself to set itself apart, maybe. This house is also, these houses were also told about in terms of this is for a developer. So the developer was very interested in the idea of the suburb and suburban houses work very well because people come to them and they're really adaptable. So they're basically almost like a blank canvas. And everybody in the suburb would buy a house and they're already thinking about how they're going to make their extension onto the rear. And with architecture, obviously, that can sometimes be somehow more finite that you have the architect's intent. The architect's intent can somehow be seen as definite, as finalized. But the developer was saying, well, actually, a lot of people, when they come to buy, they want to be able to inject or to transform or translate that into something that they have. So we kind of came up with this idea of, a, of an expandable house. So that on the, in the living room space, this is that courtyard space as we talked about in the plan, which has this living room which is between the courtyard and the garden proper, that wall splays so it gets wider out here. But in the living room, in its kind of, I guess, to be sold phase, it's defined as a double height space. And it has this uh, frieze that goes or wraps around it at, at a first floor level, which has these joist hangers in place, both as a decorative element like a like a like a panoptic freeze and uh, the, uh, what would be a doorway and the sockets are there already in position almost as a trace to what could be a future development of the project you often see schemes that would be existing buildings for architects have modified them and you can come see traits it might drop a floor but you'll see the traces of the floor beforehand this is kind of like the inversion of that almost a trace of, of what can be the future so that when one comes to inhabit it someone could look at okay maybe we want to introduce a mezzanine across here so we get a study space that's still connected to this room down here maybe you want a roof over the uh that uh that courtyard space uh that courtyard space is necessary for the place to get planning but once you have the planning uh it's up to the owner then to decide if they want to actually take that space over to become internalized or to get left as a courtyard room uh, but then the connection that's seen as a separate room lit from, lit from this roof light and maybe through double doors to the connection to the garden there. Or another option could be to completely roof over that or floor over that first floor to like become an extra bedroom, roof over this space, but that this then becomes this long type of living room. So there's multiple configurations within a very small house of how one can imagine living within it so that the, the, the client or not the client, the potential buyer has this understanding that they can put their own stamp on it or they can develop it and there's also the process of how one lives in a house and how a house can change over time to suit your needs as you go from having a family to a family leave, children leaving to going back to downsizing again that's just an image of it looking into the neighborhood this is taken from window of one of the uh surrounding houses uh, i won't go into the details of it but we're interested in in, in systems uh, maybe I will talk about it, it depends what comes up and how using this is like looking at using patent glazing. Patent glazing is a way to uniform a facade, but it isn't about the glazing being a, isn't about it letting light in necessarily or letting ventilation in. The glass or the glazing is also talked about in terms of the specular quality. So the glazing is more unifying the facade. So sometimes it might have solid wall behind it, sometimes it might have window, sometimes it pinches back in, but it's about trying to give a, a, a fairly neutral 
black facade to this uh, 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 rear garden elevation, which means that when it gets inhabited, for instance, if you build a room up here, you could, it, it's at the moment, it's a double height space, so you read out as a double height space, but when you build your room up here, again, it's about building a stud insulation partition that fits into there. And then looking at how the downpipes can be about once possibly functional, but also the fiction of them being structural because obviously they're not structural. And this idea of working with systems and I guess this comes from the conservatory room where we worked with off-the-shelf elements and how we can arrange them before we looked at how we assemble them. That kind of comes from an interest in, in early high-tech architecture. Uh, I'm originally from Dublin and I, and I moved to London in 2007 and I was quite amazed at like how British high tech, which is kind of considered like a high point in, 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 in British architecture, is almost seen now as discussed with hushed tone and, and no, it's very unfashionable. And what I like about it is I, I, I don't like where the system becomes fetishized and becomes solely about the efficiency and the economy of the fit system. And that's why in the house in uh, the, well, the yellow Metsec, which has like 36 Metsec joists, which is completely inefficient, the reason we painted it that yellow is because that's the same yellow that Foster painted his Swindon uh, factory. And I guess it's a little bit of a piss take where Foster is about kind of an efficiency and an economy of using the structure. Here we're using structure, but structure to allow atmosphere and create character. But what I like about this early British high tech work, and I guess I, I started to lose interest when Foster decided not to paint the Shanghai Bank red and he made it the, kind of the gray he uses everywhere now. But what I like about these early projects is that there's a real optimism that comes from how these systems can be applied. So this is an office or system of these uh, beams or these pivot beams. But because it's used in a residential type project, you get these spaces, the cathedral like volumes or office like volumes that suddenly you relate to. And there's a real excitement of, an, of using these systems in, in new assemblies or new configurations to make one uh, be able to build efficiently and something that can be potentially for the everyday. And this is the Hopkins house, which is like one of my favorite houses. But again, it's like how he uses uh, these Venetian blinds in a way to define spaces internally and how with the slenderness of the structure, it almost looks like a, like a line drawing. And this is the last project. I don't know how we're doing for time. Is it okay? Yeah, you're okay. Keep on going. Okay, I'll, I'll finish up with this last project. And I, what I wanted to talk about this is that it's just talks about how we try to use systems in the office. Uh, so this is for a house in West Cork uh, in Ireland on, on uh, an area of Kamaistan in natural beauty. This is the Atlantic coast here. This is Dunmaris Bay. And um, this is the site here. Uh, you can see the site here. It's uh, roughly triangular in shape with a, this existing laneway that comes down. And it has these two derelict runes on it. And it has these cluster of houses around it, which in Ireland would be called a clock on. A clock on is this kind of uh, informal gathering of settlements. So you can kind of see them in places here and places here where houses weren't built individually. Historically, houses were built in groups because your family or your neighbours would have this informal relationship where you work together to kind of obviously uh, with help with the animals or the agriculture, et cetera. But it wasn't so formal that it was described. It was quite a loose, these boundaries like existed around them. So this is kind of the remnants of a cluck on with some uh, existing houses that have been uh, refurbished and are still still in, 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 in use. So a client came with the site and we looked about how we could develop a project that could feel at once something for the 21st century, but at the same time, something that uh, spoke of this part of Ireland and the landscape and the romantic qualities that are there. So we took our cues again from not really what we wanted to do, but necessarily what was kind of given to us or what was as found. And the first thing we were interested in was that this existing room was here. And another constraint or another uh, piece we had to work with was planning policy and planning policy allows that new houses can be built in sites that have existing dwellings or rooms that are there so suddenly you have these sites that become available because they have a, a room that's there but generally how they're developed is that the room becomes one room in the house and then the house is just built on top of the whole thing so it gets consumed within its new body and actually the charm the romantic quality of that room 
is completely lost and you start to see that the rooms are just getting uh they're just getting turned into a spec two-story housing uh so what we were trying to do here is try to marry our extension and embrace it into the room so that between the old walls and the new walls we formed this outdoor room as an entrance and then because of the contours of the site we made basically a giant staircase that took you down to the reception room or this grand almost like a, a hole like a medieval hole type space with the scale and volume that was about to enjoy the view out to the sea and then off that staircase, we had these nooks and crannies, which you would see in typical Irish vernacular architecture, uh, which would be these outshots. But we use them then to almost again engage with ancillary functions of a study, a place for a day bed, which could also become a second bedroom, get guests coming over, a breakfast nook, and then a, a, a reception or entrance nook as you, as you enter into the house with the bedrooms left behind. The existing room. We looked at how we could uh, try to recognize that these are, are these are man-made objects, but actually in the psyche of the Irish landscape, these ruins are equally as important as the trees, the shrubs, the, the stone walls, and the, well, the stone walls are also man-made, but as the natural landscape. And in the Irish landscape, you start to recognize a field pattern, stone walls, borings, which are the roads. These are man-made items they are now really nature and it's 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 at what point like if you talk about the romantic uh 18th century garden at what point does man-made and nature where that ambiguity changes where that vagueness is is strictly defined and we were trying to take that through in the house so we looked at how we could condition this house or this room so it could be a space that one could use and uh so have 21st century uh climate control or not climate control but 21st century like new values uh also the house was to be built in a very remote part of ireland and even though there's servicing infrastructure there we were very keen that this house should be self-sustaining so it should generate its own electricity its own water supply uh drainage etc should all be dealt with in the most lightest touch possible so that the house is an example of how one can build in these rural conditions in the 21st century in the most uh, sustainable way to near to net uh, zero carbon, uh, both in production and life cycle. Uh, so in the room itself, we looked at uh, glazing the inside with a triple glazed frame, that allowed one to kind of obviously keep the existing quality of, of the roomless project to the outside, put in a new slab, and then roof it in a new roof that was held off the ruins, which was then roofed in uh, photovoltaic tiles. So we're, as I said before, we're really interested in servicing and environmental principles and sustainability not being seen as applications, but how actually environmental uh, technology and which is like, you know, we should just be building environmental, like, you know, building zero carbon houses should just be what we do it shouldn't even be a question anymore it's 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 like you know it, it's it should be inherent i call this idea inherently sustainable it should be as inherent as structure you know what holds up a building a building's held up but like what a building should also be completely uh environmentally sustainable but we we're interested in how we can we think that the only way that these elements can become part of the everyday culture of architecture is that to become part of the building fabric. So we didn't want to apply PVs as something that's applied onto a roof. We want to use PVs as part of the building fabric. So the PVs become a tile. Uh, so these are glass photovoltaics. I have these, you can see here, these kind of black squares are checkered on it. And they are arrayed around almost like a greenhouse with a very simple paint and glazing onto the roofs. You can see that they also go onto the roof that goes onto the, the room and then the room comes down with this existing wall that frames this outdoor room as a threshold between the, the new building and the old building but more importantly as the entrance into this new extension that takes you on then underneath the photovoltaics you can either uh use a single ply membrane to uh to, to deal with so this is just like glazing screen or a rain screen that takes water into the gutters that are here but underneath it, you can either uh, have a single ply membrane hit water down, or you can leave it open so that actually these become like giant roof lights that light into the space but beyond. Then with regard to drainage, we're interested in the idea of, of suds or sustainable drainage. So rather than having infrastructure that you take one drain or one downpipe to and then 
pipe it, uh, have to dig up the ground and take it to percolation areas. We're interested in distributing the uh, surface water runoff across the whole house. So you can kind of see in the plan here, it's a 120 square meter house, but I think we have a 80 downpipes going down to it. And again, that's the idea of the, the applied arts. Again, where we're using downpipe, not just as a means to take water away, but also as a means to screen. So they can't give you some sort of protection, but also as a way to start to kind of give the facade a certain quality to it. Um, I know I'm over, so I'm just going to quickly go through these. We're looking at how rooms and how the process and procession from arriving onto this terrace and the view you get out to the sea beyond through these cracks, how you could then start to set up a sequence of spaces using the old rooms, sometimes as a means to form a new outdoor space, or sometimes with a new building, sometimes the room and the outdoor building join together to form this new hole, then sometimes they split apart and you see that the rune and the new building are these two separate entities. So sometimes they come together or sometimes, sometimes they split apart. So depending on your perception, depending on how you walk through the site, your, 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 your understanding of the existing and the new change. This is the arrival, this kind of looking at one whole piece with a view going down. Looking back with these out shots, I that onto this glass facade, and that's a, it's a building steps down the uh, contours, the, the roof step with it, and this is this glass roof. You can kind of see this image here, the glazed roof with these roof lights where we remove the, uh, the ceiling structure underneath, and how we use the roof to kind of tie the new extension into the existing uh, uh, refurbished room. Uh, this is going back to the Clontarf house and how we're using glass, not as a necessary as a way to uh, allow light and air into a building, but looking at glass and how glass has a specular or reflective quality and how that material quality of glass is equally as important as its functional quality of glass. So we're interested in terms of how the roof here could also reflect the sky, how uh, because this is basically a glass facade here, how the downpipes were also working as a filter to give privacy to this uh, stepping stairs as you go down. You can see the facades here. So what's kind of interesting is like, it's almost this facade is almost the inversion of this facade, whereas this facade, you have a wall with windows punched into it. This is like you have a, a curtain wall with out shots extruded from it. Uh, the section going down, this is these stairs that take you down to this hall-like space, which is this space on the other side. And then the rooms inside have roofs, again, that don't follow the roof line, that have their own quality about the in intimate spaces that are they're relating to. And then these are just some uh, model photographs. This is from the top of the stair, looking down that uh, giant staircase where we have the, 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 the uh, clients and art collector and has a lot of art and a lot of books. So we use this as a gallery space for them to display their art. This is looking down that space, out to the view on Dumaris Bay. This is looking in that kitchen where you can kind of start to see where the, the, uh, the curtain wall of glass is then interrupted with these solid pochets, which are like a sleeping nook or bed uh, or, or breakfast nook. These spaces kind of have a more intimate quality, a, a kind of a, a quality that's different to the to, to the more public reception rooms of the house. And that's the last slide here, which is a, an image by uh, Idris Khan, which is called a homage to Hilton Burns Better. And it's made up of all the uh, better photographs of these gas holders, which have been overlaid on top of each other. And what I like about it is that actually that process or that the individual element isn't important. The individual gas holder photograph isn't important. What's important is this whole, which is a new thing because of how Idris Khan has assembled it. That's what I'd like to do with my architecture as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, oh, I don't know where to start. That was great. Um, so you've clearly ge generated loads of interest amongst our members because we've Quite a few questions um so i'll pass over to damien he's going to pick a couple sure. that's okay um so just answer them as you feel yeah we'll be here all night if we answer all these questions so i'll take a few and um, the first one uh in the house with the metex ceiling and the 
conservatory project and then you've showed a few more at the end there you can really see the craft involved in its construction uh, is model making a big part of your design process or how do you explore these ideas when designing yeah it, it's interesting that to use the word craft there I, I would hate to think of my buildings as crafted because you craft almost implies that there is uh like you know you need to have a certain amount of skill to put these things together how we work in the office is almost trying to take because that's it's really great when you're able to engage with skilled craftsmen and, and makers and contractors but you find that they're exorbitantly expensive and okay i would like something to feel like it's been crafted or feel like one has taken the time to work out how something's been assembled but that's not something that's done on site. Like so, historically, on site you'd have had a skilled craftsman, say in, the, in cathedrals and churches, and they've they like you know each craftsman would have a certain way of making a joint, or each craftsman would have something how something would be assembled. But what I try to do in my practice is take that off the site because that sort of level of attention and that sort of skill is very expensive because of labour, and try to put that into the assembly drawings that we do in the office. So that's why we work a lot with model because we need to be able to replicate the construction process and the assembly process that happens on site. We need to be able to somehow replicate that in the studio so that we can see scenographically how things will go together. For instance, in the Clontarf house, I don't know if I have an image of it, let's see if I do, with, with the, with the uh, on the first floor where we have these MDF linings. I'll see if I have an image of it. I don't, sorry, uh, I don't think I do. Uh, but anyhow, we have these MDF skirtings or balcomat skirtings, the colored MDF skirtings. And wherever those skirtings had to be butted up against each other, uh, that's where we drew or we specified in our construction pack that that's where we should have a socket. So a socket acts as almost a visual stitch. So, so, it, so for a, a builder on site, there's no more effort in them to do that. You've told them where the socket's going to go. You've told them where the joint's going to go. So there's no more extra work. There's no more extra time. There's no more extra expense. But it looks like the tote has gone into the assembly of that because that's been taken into the studio. So it appears that it's been crafted. But the hope is that then this can be done in an economic and an efficient way, which means that it's accessible to everybody. The difficulty with it is that it means that the time, design time is more. So it means that you have to have clients are sophisticated enough to realize that if they put the effort into the design time that they'll get a cheaper building on site, which is often, uh, often the case, but it's so rarely known. So often you'll get someone, uh, an architect, like even when we quote fees, an architect will quote a fee to do a, a tender package, they'll be half the cost of us. But then they go into site and there's lots and lots of variables and variations because they haven't drawn everything. Whereas, of course, we would like to be able to control all that. We like to draw that. We like to model that in advance. But it, 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 so it's a, it's a difficult one. To, it's a difficult one to do. But I would say I'm quite anti craft because I think that takes and like you know craftsmen are great. Don't get me wrong. And it, like, but I think if we need it to be part of the everyday culture, this needs to be things that can be done by the everyday builder. And and they should hopefully look as careful and look as thoughtful as those crafted projects but as architects we're the ones that can control that and how we make our drawings in terms of how we make our assembly packages and how we make our construction packages so that we are almost taking that intellectual craftsman quality that would happen have happened on site when they're deciding how to arrange a screw or how they're what size the screw head can be if we take that into the studio then it, it appears as if it has been crafted but actually, like, like for instance, those Metsec Joyce, uh, you know, they they are uh, agricultural product. Uh, the 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 connections around the side, how they we worked with all the standard connections that they had, but we had a discussion with Metsec for the construction package, so we knew that how we were to arrange them could be done on site without any extra cost or without any extra care, and using the systems and using the fabrication methods that that product re requires it goes back a little bit to the uh british high-tech architecture where they were really aware of systems and how systems can be used but we're not we're not necessarily interested in fetishizing them for an efficiency we're interested in, in trying to uh almost uh pull out uh, a decorative quality from them, or atmospheric might be a more uh prudent word and um, 
Second question, in your project projects, there's a lot of use of color and different aesthetic qualities. How much of that comes from conversations with the client or is it a situation where you're given more free reign over them decisions? Well, color, we, we have a lot of color. We, 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 I, don't, I don't think we'd like to associate ourselves as being an architect who uses color. I guess it's we're more of, a, of an architect process that does not not use color. Does that make sense? Like we just like, you know, so it's not like if it's, if it's, a, if it's an important thing to us, it's just not something that we just don't do. Like, you know, a lot of architects would probably just not use color and we go, well, well, why wouldn't you? Like, you know, you can when it's appropriate. And a, a lot of times where it's appropriate is, is that it's, uh, it's an economic way to, to enrich the space. And uh, for instance, the, the conservatory room, not conservatory room, the, uh, the yellow Met sec and the, 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 the facade that's the green, white and the Italian flag facade, green, white, and the, the Faro Robo colors. That comes from a client who wears Margaret Hell clothes. Like, you know, he likes gray, he likes beige. Like, you know, he's very, like, you know, natural material, natural linen. But we were, it's just an iterative process. That house was all white at one point. And then we were just looking at it and it was going, it feels like it's lacking something. It was all white, like those side returns were white. And then we just said, well, you know, this space has a bit of space here. We're playing with depth in terms of the facade. I, I didn't show you the uh, another elevation of it. it. Has a circle painted on it, and the circle is like a kind of a graphic, and this idea between depth and graphic. And it 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 was just a slow. It's a slow eking out process. We don't seek to do it. That client definitely didn't think it was going to happen. I think that client would have thought his house is going to be all colors of grey beforehand. And you know, it was just because it, it's a conversation really that. You know, it's it, 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 it's 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 steps, it's layers upon layers upon layers. And you know, if it if we felt that it was good all white, we would have left it all white. The, the yellow on the inside was a way of connecting the existing space to the new space, but by painting them the same color and having a kind of a a trompe l'oeil of, of of a, of a filigree or of a draping on one flat ceiling, and then actually having a real real not trompe l'oeil but a real depth then in the other ceiling. It allowed those two spaces to become one, and that that that, that and it was, so it wasn't about coloring there. It's about trying to make that ambiguity, so you, you didn't realize where the extension started and where the existing house ended. Because I guess in all our refurbishment works, we're more interested in the whole project rather. Like I, I hate extensions, where it's like, look at me, I'm an extension onto a house, and it's like the house no one cares about. Or you know, where someone built an extension and suddenly that middle room becomes landlocked and it doesn't have any air, it doesn't have any window, it doesn't have any light. And it's all about the it's all about the kind of the architecture or, or the architect the idea of the architect rather than the experience of the architecture. Um, this might be a tricky one, but uh, you mentioned in your yellow ceiling project that there being a joke with a client who is an engineer. How important is humor in architecture? Oh uh, God, I was saying is that like not many people would get that joke. I don't think, <laughs> like you know, uh, maybe only me. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I think levity is important, very important, because like, you know, it, it's just, well, what do I do? Do I, it's just another layer, isn't it? Like, you know, some person will get that joke, someone else won't get that joke. And that's what I mean, that I, I, it's more important to me is that there's multiple readings. Like, you know, like, you know, you could say for some architects and some maybe architects I've worked for in the past, their use of reference was too literal. It, it was too knowing. It was too, like, you know, you look at a project and it was, it was almost a collage of, 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 of quite sophisticated architectural, uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, uh, I can't think of the word, but like high architecture. Uh, and, and that only interested me to a little bit because like, you know, it, it, it didn't go beyond that. It was superficial. I'm much more, much more interested in the idea of the synthesis, or even like you know the idea of not not even the brick allure where I guess it's just taking the bits and pieces that we put together, but more the idea of how something like the Idris Khan image how it becomes just this 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 blur at the end of this whole thing. And like you know maybe someone will take out one of those uh, gas holder pictures, and that might be the witty funny one, but actually someone else won't, and that's not important. So like you know. It, it's a bit hard, I think, when I explain products and I dissect them on like these lectures because you, you, you start to talk about each of the small elements in their own slide. And then it feels like, oh, like, you know, how many ideas are you, are you trying to fit in? And I'm really aware of when new practice and doing my architecture that editing is probably more important than, than adding, adding. So like, you know, we, we are hyper aware of actually, okay, when is it cooked? When do we need to 
when we keep that for another project or, or when that talk go through. But I, like, you know, I, 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 I would say that, you know, poke face architecture doesn't interest me so much. I think we can all be a little bit uh, like, you know, humorous, like, you know, why not? Like, you no, know, I, I don't think I, I don't think I ne 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 necessarily like literal jokes are, are, are things that are like, you know, it's, it's a one liner and that's all it is. But if it's part of a, it's part of a, a weave, then, then I, I like it. Yeah. Um, in the house in Cork, how much of a challenge was it to incorporate the rooms in terms of regulations? And was it an ambition of the client to have to preserve the rooms? Uh, God, no, it, planning policy led a lot of that, or our interpretation of planning policy. Our, actually, we did a lot of research into conservation and different attitudes of conservation between, like, you know, invention, refurbishment, or, 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 or what's the, when I say invention, I mean reuse, uh, refurbishment, or restoration. And we, we were kind of interested in kind of maybe not having something that was neither, none of none of the tree and all of the tree at the same time, three, I'm saying, I don't remember it wrong. And uh, so it, it, we, we, when we first were looking at it, we were thinking that those, those runes might be gardens, like somebody might just leave them as open air spaces and that the build, house would be built around those and they would become the gardens. But then we said that we met the planners and we talked about it with the planners and they were like, absolutely not. Like, you know, you know, you have to inhabit that room that has to become a room. So we knew we had to roof over it. But then we, 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 they were basing their references on projects that were built in the locality, but we didn't think of were, were, were really critical in terms of what they were questioning and how these rooms can be. You know, so there was a question of like, yes, if you do this, you, you get planning. But we wanted to really think about, well, what can be an exemplar or, or what can be a way where we can build something for the client, but actually for the passerby or for the visitor, the quality of the room, the quality of the landscape that these once were, were inhabited, it's still there to some impact. And it, it, it was kind of tuned like that. And then regard to building regulation, yeah, building regulation is really important. Like, uh, And again, it's, it's just another constraint, like, you know, understanding what, what size you need or how many glass or what thickness of glass you need to to produce a new value or, or and you know understanding uh where where one has to have an inhabitable room as, as you enter the site so that becomes a space that you use like they're just old drivers that you use you don't see them as like i think if you come with a preconceived idea they can become problematic but if they if you just use them as context, as you're using sustainability as con as context, if you're using thing as context, you're just conducting it then. You're just saying, okay, so we know a WC has to be there for visitors. We know we have to have a habitable room there for someone. We know the room has to be roofed over. So the project kind of almost leads you. It's like almost joining the dots. And I think that's when you're being most successful, when it's not like, oh, I have this singular idea. Like uh, we're teaching thesis at the moment in, in UCD and we had crits there not that long ago. And I remember when the critics come out, well, what's your thesis idea? And I'm sorry, I couldn't say anything, but in my head, I was like going, oh, don't ask that question. Because like, for me, that's not interesting. Like, you know, it's not really about like, what's your big idea? It's about like, you know, what is the experience? What's the feeling of the place? And you, and you use all the constraints to start to generate that. Uh, we have one more question. I won't keep you too much longer. Uh, what inspirations are other architects work has been significant to you as you've progressed from university to practice. Oh wow! Yeah, well, that's 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 quite good. Uh, I, I I think my university, this probably you know you go guys are in university, but my university uh, career wasn't great. Uh, I, I really feel my education was as an apprentice. So like my education was in the offices I worked in. So like I graduated in two thousand and three, and and I worked for thirteen years, and luckily got to work with a lot of my heroes, and really I learned in those studios. So like, I'm a mongrel, like, you know, my architecture is a version, hopefully a, a synthesis of a lot of those ideas and, you know, those practices that I was in and taking bits I enjoyed from them and taking bits I didn't enjoy from them and then trying to work out what my first thoughts are from that. But I'd say that the practices that I worked in are, were probably the most important practices to me uh, in terms of how, because I, 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 I am made of those. And I worked in I worked in five practices, I think. So I, I worked quite a lot of offices. Uh, so 
Okay, very good. Uh, I think that's all the questions we have. Or all yeah. the we've, all we've got time for. Maybe I don't want to keep you for too long. Um, that's I'll say another thank you to you and uh, thanks for our members for getting involved with those questions. Those were fun. Oh, thank you very much. Enjoy. And I'll just take us off live now.